Hello, everybody. This is After the Oligarchy. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis Varoufakis is the former Greek finance minister, a professor of economics, co-founder of DM25 and the Progressive International, leader of Mera25 and member of Greek Parliament. This is the second in a series of interviews with Professor Varoufakis. If you haven't watched the first, check that out. Today's conversation is in association with Meta, the Centre for Post-Capitalist Civilization, and the topic is Yanis's latest book, Another now, how about here this time? Another now, oh. <laughs> didn't have it last time, published in 2020, which presents a vision of a post-capitalist society. It's an advanced discussion of the model proposed in that book. If you want an introduction, I made a 40-minute video doing just that, which will appear here, though I do recommend that you read the book. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me on uh, After the Oligarchy. Uh, we lived under the Oligarchy, but anyway... Uh, let's imagine. Let's imagine. Let's imagine. <laughs> exactly. So, again, I have a lot of questions for you. We'll begin with a question about housing, because after I posted the first interview and also the model summary, something that kept coming up again and again from commenters was that they were worried about security under the commercial housing sector. So the problem raised was basically, so you're saying that every year or every period of time, I have to keep bidding to retain access to my my house and you know if somebody comes along who has more money than me then then I get kicked out and of course I mean I certainly appreciated the ingenuity of the mechanism you know to try to constantly reveal the opportunity cost of the land and the housing for society to be able to get that back so that there isn't a, a rentier dynamic in housing how would you respond to that question of security well firstly remember that this is about the commercial zone in in my blueprint uh, every county think of it as counties every county chooses to create a space that's not, I mean, it's democratically determined how large this commercial zone will be. The purpose of this commercial zone is for you to be done commercially by the many, for the many, in order to extract rents from those who want to operate in the commercial zone, uh, rents with which to uh, build social housing, social zoning, social entrepreneurial activities, common spaces, the commons, Right, So it is, I think, a good feature, a well-designed feature of the commercial zone that anybody who wants to operate in it has to live in fear. <laughs> if, you, if you want to live in a, in a house that, that you paid for, not in a social house, right, On, not in a unit within social housing, then yeah, I mean, live in fear. Uh, and uh, it's not, uh, uh, remember, it's not just that once a year you bid for it, but it's something like a perpetual auction whereby anybody can actually outbid you and throw you out, which is great because you, the commercial zone is there to make money for the many, for every citizen who lives in the social zone and whose activities, whether they're it's poetry readings or paintings or um, producing social goods, um, you know, th these are being funded by the commercial enterprises within the commercial zone. So it's okay if you, if you live in fear. And the whole point of this permanent auction is to ensure that there is complete incentive compatibility. In other words, that when you declare to the authorities what you value that building or piece of land as, uh, that, that you're truthful. And you will only be truthful if, yeah, you can, you can, you can undervalue it if you want, but then somebody can, can come and outbid you and throw you out. So I have no um, defense to those who say that, oh, the people who live there in the commercial zone live in fear. We want them to live in fear. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a game for them. The crucial point here is that you don't have to live in the commercial zone. But, you know, I would live in the social zone. But if you want you know, a fancy house, a much fancier house than you deserve. <laughs> or, you know, you want to, to, to create an enterprise in a place that society does not deem that you should have it, then, yeah, you pay for it. And if you make the money for it, yeah, good. It all goes back to social housing and the, the social zone. Okay, so it's really that the, the priority is being put on the redistributive function of the commercial housing zone. We move on to something else. So I have a series of questions about income and wealth inequality. 
Mm -hmm. This is also a concern for some people. You know, it's a concern for me as well and in any kind of market system. Yeah. So for example, let's talk about taxation. So in another now, there are two taxes. I mean, you know, maybe there could be a, a carbon tax, but let's not go into that. There is a corporation tax, which is a tax yep. on the revenue of all firms. Okay. And then there's a land tax. And we were talking about that there. Land so, tax only in the commercial zone. Only the commercial. Yes, exactly. On the commercial zone. Yeah. yeah. One might say, well, are you serious? You know, there's no income tax. Yeah. No. Because, because no there could be seriously divergent incomes because different firms could have much uh, different rates of profitability for uh, revenue streams. So it's likely, one might say, that there is a lot of inequality generated, but there's no progressive income I'm tax. Not I don't believe they will. Look, if you look at the capitalist system or techno feudal system in which we live today, inequality, mind numbing and soul crushing inequality is the result of two things. Firstly, the private ownership of firms, of the means of production, you know, shares, share markets. That's one. And finance is the second one. That's where, yeah, the huge inequality that is destroying our spirit comes from not to mention our planet, okay? In another now, there will be neither because uh, shares are distributed on the basis of one employee, one member, one share, one vote. Uh, and there is no financial sector. The financial sector has been taken over by a distributed ledger of the central bank. And um, uh, therefore, this uh, highly problematic, toxic duet Dueto in Italian between the banker and the mogul, the banker creating printing money out of thin air, lending to the mogul who uses the printing presses of the private bank in order to corner the market in the share market and effectively own everything. And then wealth begets wealth. Now, why is Zuckerberg so much, much wealthier today than he was at the beginning of the pandemic. Nothing to do with the profitability of Facebook. It's got to do with the fact that there is this combination of financial capital, okay, uh, the printing presses of the central bank working for Zuckerberg, not for the people, not for the many, unlike in another now, and ownership of Facebook. Uh, if you break down ownership of Facebook, and Facebook is equally owned by everybody who works in Facebook, right? And if you end the printing presses, both of the state and the private sector banks operating at full throttle on behalf of the very, very few, then the inequality that you and I are used to goes. goes. Not everybody's going to earn the same. Yes, some companies are going to have to make more money than others. And some people will make more money within the same company because of the bonus system, uh, system that I've envisaged. But the differences between pay and capacities of those people will be minuscule. I don't want to, want to live in a, in, in, a, in a society where everybody gets exactly the same independently of what they do. But the magnitude, the order of magnitude and inequality that we're facing is simply impossible in a system like the one I, des I, I describe in another now. Okay, so I, I have two responses to that. The first is that one might say, yes, the inequality could be much less, and it would be. I, I think it's it's hard to imagine that it would be anything like uh, it is at the moment, but that the levels of inequality now are so outrageously great that it's not a reasonable point of comparison. So we need to think about whether the inequality that would, would exist would be tolerable rather than whether it would be less than what exists now. But f say, for example, this point though is very interesting. It's it's somebody might say, okay, okay, I, I see what you're saying, but why not have any progressive income tax? What's the reasoning behind that? Well, because we want a simple society in which people don't pay taxes. Yeah, you know, the only reason why we care about income tax today is because we have a classist, stratified society where some have everything and the rest have nothing, and the rest of the world who don't have much, right, uh, say, well, we really need an income tax. It's a way of recouping something back from the bastards that have everything. Well, if we do away with social classes based on private ownership of means of production, then that, that sentiment and the argument simply disappears. 
um, we, we will not need income taxes and we're not going to certainly not need sales taxes or, you know, um, uh, value added taxes, VATs. What's the point? What would be a, a range of incomes that you think would be acceptable? Uh, you know, we don't need to get too particular about it and, you know, 1.7 and things like this, but roughly, what do you think? Anything that, that comes out of another now. And let me, let me be clear on this. The problem I have with inequality in capitalism is that it is the result of exploitation. Yeah? You see, liberals and, and, and free marketeers and right-wingers present capitalism like an Olympics 100-meter sprint. Some people are faster, some people are slower. Okay? And what can we do? The faster man or woman is going to win a gold medal. The others can you know, just dream of it. But this is an awful metaphor for capitalism. Capitalism is not a race where some win and some lose. The problem is not inequality. The problem is exploitation. So if you really want a parable for capitalism, the 100-meter sprint is not a good one. Do you want, I'll, I'll give you my parable. Sure. It's like when the, Brits, when the Brits went to the Himalayas okay, as conquerors uh, during the Raj, during the British Empire and beyond that, and they had the Sherpas carrying them and their pianos, and their desks, all the way to Mount Everest. Okay? So, if you get rid of this relationship, if the Sherpas are not carrying the, the colonial masters on their shoulders, then I don't mind if somebody manages to get up to Mount Everest and somebody else doesn't. So, um, if there is inequality, when we do not have capital, fueling exploitation, which then results into much greater inequality, which then results into more capital that then fuels exploitation, then I don't have a problem. And by the way, in an, another now, um, if, let's say that, you know, of course, you never, you never can predict that. Human malice can always sit in and subvert even the most beautiful uh, social arrangements, rules of the game, right? Well, there is um, a fallback position. There is an insurance policy. It's uh, the, the juries of citizens randomly selected, like in the Irish Assembly, uh, in the case of your referendum on abortion. Yep. Uh, and they, those juries have the capacity to disband a company that is misbehaving or producing exploitation of some kind of form that we are not in a position today to, to predict. So you have that insurance policy as well. Yes, I mean, that's a very good analogy for capitalism. The, the, the exploitation that you're talking about is very important, which is, I mean, you're talking primarily about the exploitation of the working class by the capitalist class, say, within a firm, the kind of the pre-distribution of income uh, from the, the people who do the work to those who make an income just by having some legal title, some, some claim to the ownership of property. And that's crucial. But to play devil's advocate, would you not think that there's also an element that the the market a uh, market society itself as a mode of distribution and the the competition involved in that even through purely statistical effects can will lead to pretty big divergences in income and hence wealth over time that it's something that arises from the nature of the system itself rather than just the structure within a firm and that this could over time lead to a polarization. So that without without a progressive income tax, this this would happen or it would happen even faster? No, I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that we are uh, making the mistake of assuming, because that has been the historical reality up to now, that property rights go hand in hand with markets. If you take away property rights over a means of production, then markets do not have this tendency. Uh, yes, there will be patterns. There will be patterns. And there will be waves, ripples. You know, think of a pond with ripples of inequality. But there will be ripples. There will not be massive waves like in Hawaii, right? And um, they will dissipate. Because um, don't forget, and maybe I'm preempting one of your questions here, that you will not be able to uh, leave to your children a house, building, land, shares, means of production, capital. So the whole thing will dissipate. There will be ripples that will be lost in the sand. Yeah, that was actually the, the next question was actually about inheritance. So very good. Just So just to be clear, is there any private inheritance at all? Of course. Yeah. 
there but is. Not of means of production. So what so what inheritance is there? My, my stamp collection, I can leave to my daughter. My books, my writings, you know, my favorite jumper. Um, a watch that my father gave me. Yeah, I can leave all this to my kids, but I cannot leave productive resources like houses, like land, like shares, like factories. What about money? Can you leave money? Yes, you can leave money, money, but money does not build money in another now because money cannot buy you capital. Ha. And that is the essence. It cannot buy you shares. It cannot be financialized. And therefore, it can be lent at an interest. But that's neither here nor there in terms of uh, of inequality boosting and creation. Well, that was another question, which is that, I mean, to take this in two different directions, uh, would you not think that, you know, there's a the legacy payment, which is a large trust fund that every resident gets, and that would be mm-hmm. something that would be on the order of a year's salary, maybe two years salary um, or return to capital, whatever way you want to put it. And so is private inheritance not redundant in that case since everybody starts off with the legacy private inheritance only serves to make an, a more uneven starting place for everybody look i wouldn't mind a situation whereby the, the revolution that begets the other now we say okay let's all start from zero and we all get a legacy payment and then we have our our dividends and you know our basic income and so on i wouldn't mind that but if you want to win over people to this idea, uh, you want to make it maximally acceptable to them. And I don't mind telling a rich person, person you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can keep your dough, keep your money. What you are not going to be allowed to do is to use it in order to buy up productive resources by which you can exploit others who don't have them. Uh, and then I, I really do believe that even if you start with very unequal bank accounts or, you know, accounts in our distributed ledger central bank system. The important thing from where I'm standing is that whatever inequalities in resources, in monetary resources there are, they cannot buy the capacity to exploit. So, you know, if, if it means you can, you can buy more stuff, buy more stuff. What are, we, what are you going to do with the more stuff? You know, you're going to end up with a garage full of rubbish. Uh, but you will not be able to create more power for yourself to exploit others. That is the essence. And once you do that, the whole thing is going to dissipate. Uh, You're going to have inequalities, but you're not going to have exploitative capacities or extractive power that can generate the kind of abysmal social clashing and conflict that we live in today. I know you've talked about this before. So the question is about having money which depreciates over time or is time limited as a measure to to preclude or to reduce the hoarding of wealth. Is this something that you would consider? No, not in the another. No, it's not necessary. Capitalism, in capitalism, would be a good idea. It would be a way of uh, doing two things. On the one hand, making it difficult for people to hoard money. And on the other hand, to stimulate the economy when you've reached uh, a serious recession. Because um, as we know from the last 10, 12, 13 years after 2008, when uh, interest rates reach zero, they cannot become negative because people will simply hold cash. But if the cash is not physical and it's digital and you can have a, you know, a, a negative interest rate, that's effectively shrinking money. But yeah. these are all second rate suboptimal remedies for something that cannot be remedied, capitalism. But in another now, you don't need that. One more thing on this topic. So when we're talking about inheritance and the ability to turn money into money, just about finance. So finance would work very differently in another now than under capitalism. However, consider the situation where if somebody starts with 1 million euro and they're earning 3% or 5% on that, they're going to gather wealth at a much faster rate than somebody who starts off with 100,000 or 10,000. This is, even though finance works very differently in another now, this is still a way that people can turn money into money. And perhaps initially, all they can do is, is turn that into higher claims on consumption of final goods. But eventually, maybe a generation or two along the line, or who knows, that could form into class divisions. So I'm just throwing out that question. What do you think about that? I'm not worried about this. 
Yeah. Because firstly, the rich who trans- transition from capitalism to another now, to post- the post-capitalist another now, okay? Yes, they will be made able to use compound interest rate to have more and more. But that will not result in a different social class. It will result in more spending power. The reason why we have social classes in capitalism is because you can, it's a, it, it, it's a zero sum game or constant sum game. If you have money and the other doesn't, then you can buy means of production that the other one will not have access to. And by ensuring that the other one does not have access to it, you can actually make them do things. <laughs> you yep. can grant them access to the means of production, to the tractor, to the land, to the factory, and so on. Yeah, you have power over them. And that's where um, society becomes uh, abysmal and just cruel. But if they all the meat means that they can buy more rubbish, let them buy more rubbish. I don't care if some people have a capacity to fill their houses with gadgets. Let them buy gadgets. That doesn't give them power over me or over my daughter or son. You see what I mean? So I'm not worried. Yeah. Let's move on to something a little bit different. This is about firms. So the first question is that in another now, you state that for the most part, firms would be less than, say, 300 staff. Not all of them, but but most of them would be. And this would be because, firstly, the, the flat management structure, and secondly, the lack of a share market. So the question is, could you just elaborate and talk about that a bit? And, and also... Would this really be the case? Uh, would there not be firms who, who, which would be bigger? Well, one never knows. This is an, an empirical question. We have to institute yeah. uh, another now and then watch what happens. Sure. But remember, even if this happens and we don't like it, there are two ifs here. If it happens and we don't like it, because it may happen and may not be a problem. You may have a large cooperative firm, which is actually good for society. But let's say, for argument's sake, that both ifs are fulfilled, Okay, then what happens? Well, we have the social worthiness index and the juries. We can break them up, those companies. There's nothing stops us. And it's not the state that does it. It is the juries of citizens who are representative of the stakeholders in some kind of sector enterprise. Uh, so we have the means to break up companies if, 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 they, if they get large and we don't like it that they are large. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think they would get large. Uh, organically speaking, in an evolutionary sense, because the whole point about corporate syndicalism, this um, corporate law that I have imagined, that I've conjured up in another now, is that you know, every member of a company, every worker, every, every employee has one share, one vote, uh, which means that everybody wants to, or is participating, wants to participate and is participating in decision-making. Now, would you want to be in a situation where you have to make collective decisions with another 20,000 people? I don't think you would. <laughs> so if you, if you take a company like General Electric, for instance, right, or Facebook for that matter, any large corporation today, and you introduce corporate syndicalism, you'll find very quickly that people will want to spin off, that employees themselves will say, okay, now we are the division making washing machines for General Electric. Why, why do we need to be in the same company as the ones who are making, you know, jet engines? So let's split them up. Uh, they've got nothing to lose from doing that, except peace of mind and a better capacity to make decisions. Why do the washing machine makers want to make decisions together with the ones who make jet engines? I don't think they would want to do that. It would be just too unwieldy for them. It would reduce their capacity to play a significant role. If they did that, if they agreed to keep the company large or to make the company large, they would then have themselves to validate and to endorse the creation of a managerial class within the company of some of their colleagues who will be doing the management because it will be too unwieldy. Why would they want to do that? Why would they want to create bosses for themselves? Well, this leads on to the next question, which is closely related about monopoly. Let me get into that by answering that question. Let's say, again, playing devil's advocate, there are economies of scale which come from market size and there's an opportunity to uh, have greater market power and hence achieve greater rates of profit. So you might have a workplace where they decide because of market competition that they would like to get bigger and bigger because that's one strategy 
that you can use to achieve higher uh, profits and, and market share. So that, you know, wh- whether or not that would happen, that would certainly be one motivation for mm-hmm. this to happen. So I suppose there's that. And I, uh, the, the question is as well, what about, you've, you've kind of answered this already, but I suppose it's about what about private monopolies? Because if we're transitioning to um, another now from this society, we'd already be starting with many markets, which are monopolies and oligopolies. And then also we could imagine that they might arise from time to time. So what's What's the approach there? Well, the key, the, the key social device there that stops that is a jury. The jury can break them up. Say, you're not in the public interest. Your social worthiness index is too low. And therefore, we, we break you up. Unless you want to stop operating this way. And here is a set of conditions for you uh, to fulfill if you don't want to be broken up. Price, quantity, you know, quality of the, of the product. And if you don't want to do that, then we break you up. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then, but they, 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 they can be a positive input from the juries. The juries can say, "Okay, society, here we need a X, Y, and Z," and says, "Okay, who wants to bid for X, Y, and Z to produce X, Y, and Z under these conditions that we set?" I think that answers. I mean, we already have antitrust legislation or uh, anti-monopoly legislation. If that was actually implemented, things would look very differently, even in capitalism. But you see, the reason why in capitalism they're not to be implemented is because the private ownership, the fact that there are some people who own a whole range of corporations and therefore they own the government and they own the authorities that are supposed to police the antitrust legislation. That's why the antitrust legislation doesn't work. And another now there is no such problem. (laughs) <laughs> yes, absolutely. The the political process is completely captured and, and an instrument of class rule. Okay, so these firms in these worker owned firms in another now, you say that they have a flat management structure, uh, a fluid way of organizing themselves, uh, pretty much as non hierarchical as you could imagine. And something that came up in the comments uh, a few times was people were asking, this would certainly be appropriate in some cases, but is this appropriate in all cases? And I suppose you, you could add in, unless this way of organizing a firm is legislated, why would a, a firm necessarily choose to do this? Surely they might choose to do it different ways in, in different firms. That's correct. That's That's correct. That, that's a complication which I don't have in the book. After all, it is a novel, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we're having these conversations because you know, yeah, how can you absolutely. do all that in and 200 thank you, pages? And I, and, yeah. I thank you, and I thank you for that, for the opportunity to go beyond the novel. Um, but I think it's the, the way in which corporate syndicalism is described in the book is a good way of describing the default, the basic case. And then, of course, you can have special cases. Now, for instance, I was thinking myself, uh, take a newspaper or a website, a, a news website. Now, somebody has to decide what goes on the front page, okay? Uh, horizontal management is not appropriate for that. Horizontal management is appropriate for allowing anybody on this newspaper, let's say electronic internet newspaper, uh, to do what, to write whatever they want and to pursue whatever st- line they want to pursue and, and do whatever investigation they wanted to do. But then, of course, it, it, it is perfectly possible to have a situation where and uh, people actually vote for which is the article that will go on the front page or to even appoint an editor. But the editor will be appointed by the shareholders who happen to be everybody writing pieces in this newspaper, not some shady person that nobody knows of who owns a company that owns another company that owns another company that owns, owns the newspaper. So there, there, there may be um, room for, and there should be in the corporate legislation, uh, there should be room for um, adjusting and amending the management style to the needs of the particular sector. But as a basis, right, this must be a decision that the shareholders make. In other words, the workers. I'll do something different. It's about the disjointedness criterion. And just to explain to viewers, the disjointedness criterion in another now is the way of deciding who gets to have a share in the company and who doesn't. Who's a member of the cooperative and who provides a, a service, let's say, or a good to the, the company as an outsider. I've got um, a question from two different directions. So let's let's start with, with this one. 
because I'm sure this is something that a lot of people are thinking. There are some comments about this. You know, somebody gave this long story. I'm not going to go into all of it. Basically, the, the issue of, look, it's a nice idea that everybody is a member, but what if you have, I think they gave an example of a psycho psychotherapist or a psychiatrist practice and they hire a secretary and they're both equal partners in this and they're both making decisions, but one of them has decades of experience and the other one is, uh, you know, a 20 year old who doesn't know anything about it. Or they gave, you know, there's another example. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but they, there's another example they're told about somebody who created, uh, I think it was a meditation business and they brought people on and it became a cooperative, but it was their dream and they were the most committed to it. And then other people don't necessarily share that same commitment and so forth. So if you could respond to that, because this is something which comes up whenever anybody, not just in another now, proposes worker owned enterprises. Well, we all have the right to, to retain a monopoly of ownership of our dreams. What they don't have the right is to exploit the labor of others as part of pursuing our dreams. Uh, when it comes to, for instance, the case of the psychiatrist and the, the, the secretary, creating a hierarchy in our head um, is fine. Yeah, there's no doubt that the, without the psychiatrist, um, there will be no psychiatric service. But, you know, when it comes to politics, the political arena, the political market, let's put it in this awful way, uh, <laughs> you know, you can have similar arguments, and they're very powerful arguments, arguments against democracy. Um, you know, you, you have um, somebody who has given their lives, you know, somebody like you know, a modern day Socrates, who is a philosopher uh, and a, a wonderful citizen and, and, and somebody who really thinks deeply about the matters of the state, the matters of society. And then you have a completely literate fool who does, who's, you know, who's, he's, you know, he's a gambler and a drug addict and an idiot. And they have the same vote. How can you assume that these people will have the same vote? What do you do? Because that's democracy. That's the beauty of it. One person, one vote. So this is my answer regarding the first example. Regarding the second example, it's your dream. Well, if it's your dream, make sure you bring in people that share your dream. And, um, you know, and, and, and if your dream is powerful enough, okay, and you're bringing the right people in, uh, those people will actually share your dream and they will serve your dream. And if in the end they outvote you, it means that your dream has either not been particularly powerful or you were not very careful as to whom you went into association with. Yeah, I, I think that's a good argument. I mean, one of the ways I think about this, even at the most deflationary level, is that no economic system is going to be perfect. No system in general, no machine, no anything is perfect. There are always pros and cons. So... <sighs> Whenever you're cons we're considering a, a system and its function, we need to think about what are the errors we're willing to tolerate. We need to pick a, a set of errors that are the least bad uh, and pick them. And so a cooperative society, social society is going to have its own cons. And for me, the idea is that those cons are going to be much less harmful, much less pernicious than the ones but which come see, from. I don't even think that the, I don't even think that it is a con. Uh, in, in other words, a disadvantage, not a con in the sense of being a con job. No. <laughs> I don't think yeah. that's right. If I have a dream about something, right, and I bring people in uh, as wage labor, okay, then if this is a successful enterprise, then I have power to force them to do things that they would rather not do. Okay, I don't think that this is a wrong. It is wrong to remove this power from anybody who has a dream and who was the originator of a company. You know, it forces people like me, you, the meditation expert that <laughs> guru that you mentioned before, it's not a bad thing. I don't think it's a disadvantage to have forces to carry people with us, to make them, to, to inspire them, not to force them to do as they are told because we own the business and they don't. Just to be clear, I, I agree with you. I mean, that's really the point. But uh, I suppose what I was saying is that even when that causes problems, even when it causes inefficiencies, if something doesn't happen, the point that I'm making is that that's something that I think we can live with because Remember, of the benefits. The, the beauty of another now is that the market is there. It is liberated from capitalism, but it's not everything. So uh, let's say you create this meditation center. You bring in the wrong people. You make a mistake. And you have these very difficult characters. And you can't get rid of them because now they are members. And they are the majority. You leave. So what? You do something else. You don't, you know, your whole existence does not rely on this business. 
And we are moving away from this. We, it, 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 it's a, I, I, I try to imagine a society where we don't need business, but we do business because it's fun. And if it doesn't, and we do it in a, in a co- cooperative way. And if it doesn't work, you know, bugger it, go. We'll do something else. We'll find another group of people to play with. You know, this capacity to choose your partners and without the fear that, my goodness, if this partnership breaks down, how am I going to put food on the, uh, food on the table? How am I going to make the end? How will my children go to school? That goes away. A brilliant note to end on because we're out of time. So I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me again. Wonderful discussion as always. Just quickly in terms of other interviews and things like that, are you generally interested in continuing this? Because there's a lot of questions and, and issues. Sure, to well, let's, still- let's do it again in, a, in a month's time or so. I'm quite happy. This is a very good discussion. Okay, that's great. Thank you for watching. If you found this interesting, useful, or thought-provoking, then press the like button, consider subscribing, and if you really enjoyed it, sacrifice your firstborn to Jelaine Maxwell. There's a lot more such material to come. We will keep exploring the intricacies of better futures for humanity until we get there. And as always, I want to read your thoughts in the comments section below. That's all for now. The only viable future for humanity is one after the oligarchy.